There's nothing more horrifying to people than the prospect of nuclear warfare, and no game franchise is more recognized for tapping into this avenue than Fallout. The thought of the world being consumed by nuclear fire is scary enough, but even scarier for some is the thought of needing to carry on life in the shattered world that remains behind. When Interplay Productions created the franchise back in 1997, they might not have realized how sought after that experience was going to become in the future. Everyone has their own opinions about which Fallout is the best. <coughs> But what is objective is that Fallout really didn't enter into the mainstream zeitgeist until the advent of Fallout 4. If you've heard of Fallout, then you're definitely familiar with at least two things, Vault Boy and Power Armor. But Fallout contains so many more features and aspects and quirks that make this game such a gem to enjoy. This game has become so popular and recognizable that it's completely reasonable to think that Fallout could replace Halo as Microsoft's flagship title to accompany the release of their next-gen consoles in the future as well. We do this my way! I'm the one in charge! Not anymore, you're not. Oh, snap. And with the success of their latest project, the Fall TV show, the future of the series has been locked in. But for right now, let's take a look at where Fallout came from, what makes it so fun, and why Fallout 76 should be stricken from the canon. Back on October 10th, 1997, Tim Kaine and his team at Interplay Productions graced the world with their first installment of the Fallout series, the game was successful enough to warrant them making a sequel, and both received critical acclaim for the new franchise. Interplay Productions is also responsible for making Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, but you never hear about that from the OG Fallout gatekeepers, do ya? Nope, it's always just original Fallout this, New Vegas that, Bethesda sucks ass. Look, I have my problems with Bethesda too, but I'm just pointing out a little bit of double standard here. But anyway, Bethesda bought the rights to Fallout in 2004 and released Fallout 3 as the first first-person shooter RPG mainline series game in the Fallout franchise. Bethesda then gave Obsidian, a then-recent game studio comprised of a team that included the original creators behind the Fallout IP, the license to make Fallout New Vegas, and they only had 18 months to do it. This time crunch forced them to not only use all of the same assets that Bethesda used for Fallout 3, but also to cut a lot of content that they wanted to put into the game. There are just some areas of the Mojave that just feel completely unfinished, yet Obsidian still managed to create one of the best video games in history, I will die on that hill. Bethesda continued with the franchise in Fallout 4, a fun game to play, and later on Fallout 76, a soulless cash grab pretending to be a fun game to play. And finally, where we are right now, Bethesda worked in tandem with Kilter Films and Amazon to create the Fallout TV show, one that is either loved or hated by fans of the series. There are three main aspects that I think solidify Fallout as an iconic series among the horde of game titles that have been created throughout gaming history. Those three aspects are setting, agency, and replayability with agency perhaps being the most significant of these. Agency not only infers player control, but it also bolsters the replayability of any game. However, there probably wouldn't be too many people around to experience this agency if it weren't for the unique and gripping setting of the Fallout series. And while Bethesda's titles differ in many ways, they still share a common past of a global resource war and a similar present of a harsh, mutated wasteland. So let's take a look at what actually makes Fallout Fallout. Fallout presents the initial prospect of a scene of terror, global thermonuclear warfare. This is the main context of the game, but as a player, you're preoccupied with the events of the time, whether that's restoring your vault's broken water purifier, hunting down the man who tried to kill you, or simply trying to survive the trials and tribulations of the wastes. The bombs are old news, but Fallout as a game makes a point to remind you of that chilling past. The most obvious detail to point to is the wasteland. It's barren and infested with mutated creatures that want to murder and probably eat you. They're the stuff of nightmares, and they only could have been born out of being bathed in nuclear radiation for years and years and decades and centuries. It's the perfect canvas upon which to paint post-nuclear war. Each game contains that same iconic desert-like post-nuclear America sprinkled with shabby metal villages or communities built out of ruins and rubble. Except for West 
West Virginia, which for some reason managed to perfectly preserve its forest and swamp despite the buildings of Charleston literally crumbling to pieces only a couple miles away. You blew it. But this is the game's sandbox. Stop it. You can explore the shattered fragments of old houses or towns that have been reduced to piles of rubble. Witness the skeletal remains of people's last moments on Earth right before nuclear detonation, or simply rummage and loot. And on top of all this destruction, raider gangs and primitive tribes dominate the American wastes constantly threatening whatever excursion you are undertaking. There are only a handful of dedicated, organized factions trying to restore some semblance of order to the wasteland. Factions like the Brotherhood of Steel, the Enclave, the New California Republic, or even Caesar's Legion. These factions are usually the focal point of the games, but the tribulations of day-to-day -day life for the denizens of the broader wasteland are enough to demand much of the player's attention. And beneath all this barren destruction lies the vaults. Every game is littered with the remnants of these vaults in one form or another. But even the vaults that were meant to serve as safe houses to shield the lucky few from the blast didn't fare much better than the communities on the surface. Some are sealed up tight, others have regular communities that exist inside the vault, outside the vault, or both, and others still are broken and crumbling, hiding secrets of a sinister past yet undiscovered by the unwitting surface dwellers that live in that area. Upon investigating the dilapidated halls of some of these vaults, the player finds out that each vault was actually a separate social experiment set up by Vault Tech. And the show reveals that other major corporate titans like Robert House and Robco and General Atomics were also given the rights to set up their own social experiments in their own vaults in exchange for investor support. Some vaults were left completely untouched and were simply meant to just open up after a set period of time to allow their inhabitants to go back out and colonize the wasteland with ample resources and defenses. But others were turned into twisted tests of human behavior or the psychological consequences of organizing groups of people in a certain way. Vaults 68 and 69, for example, were set up to house 999 males and one female in Vault 68 and 999 females and one male in Vault 69. Nice. Nice. This just gives you an idea of the twisted logic behind Vault Tech's uh, safe houses. Some were cloning laboratories, others were hydroponics bays with mutated plants, and others yet still were just Nazi level experimentation zones. But all these little details and information can be completely missed by a player if they simply choose to beeline through the story and never get sidetracked. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, simply that the option exists. And this option is exactly what leads us into our next point, agency. Have you ever wanted to recreate the Call of Duty mission No Russian on the Las Vegas Strip? Well now you can! How about at Fenway Park? Well now you- Oh, actually, you can't technically kill everyone, but I guess you could add some mods and stuff to make it happen. Whatever. The point I'm making is that the game gives the player a lot of control and options on how they progress things. You have the option to make good or bad choices depending on what outcome you want, or simply depending on what kind of loot you want. Some NPCs are carrying unique weapons or armor that you might want to get your hands on, and then you're forced to make the difficult decision, do I let them walk away with that shiny piece of thing that I want? Now, we could get into a discussion about which games present these choices in a more realistic fashion or a more interesting fashion. For instance, I remember watching a video from H Bomber Guy about Fallout 3 and how he was railing against the bomb choice within Megaton. You either have the choice to blow up the bomb or not blow up the bomb. Good or bad. And he really railed against how it was this black and white decision and there was no complexity to the issue at all. And I agree with him to a lot of that point, but at the same time, the player is deciding whether or not they want access into Ten Penny Tower, which is a very luxurious, more inviting environment than Megaton. So the game asks you the question, do you actually want to be here? How much do you want to be here around all these normal people? Are you willing 
willing to go to the lengths that they're asking you to go to. So it's a little bit redeeming, but he still makes a really good point about how Fallout New Vegas packages these moral decisions in a much more interesting and gripping way and in a way that makes it last and makes it feel impactful for the player. He pointed to the NCR sharecropper farming losing their water if you decide to divert the flow of water to Freeside and give them water. That is a very, very moral gray area. Are you going to deprive this farming community of water in favor of giving this impoverished community some extra water that they also need? But at the same time, I could pull a random quest out of New Vegas and say, hey, look, look at this silly moral dilemma that's very obviously just a black and white situation. That comes from the Ultralocks. They are very obviously committing an evil, heinous act. They are holding a man hostage in a freezer cell and deciding whether or not they want to eat him. This is a tribe of former cannibals that took on a Vegas casino after Mr. House elevated them to that position, but the player is presented with a very similar option to the one in Megaton. You walk into the Ultralux and you find out that this is going on and you're presented with the option, do you convince them to eat him or do you convince them to not eat him? Those are the basic decisions and there's more to it, you can kind of trick them into to thinking they ate human meat or trick Mortimer, the guy who wants to do this, into revealing that it was a human meat even though it wasn't and then you get him in trouble. Like they make it very interesting the way that it plays out, but at the same time it's that moral black and white that H Bomber guy referenced. But anyway, the point that I'm making there is that there are branching paths and there are choices that you can make in the world and the world will evolve and change and people will be different afterwards in the world because of it. They will treat you differently or you will gain access to different things that weren't there before. So Fallout across the board has this feature for the player. You have agency, you have control over things, you have options of how you want to carry things out in the wasteland. Fallout 3 locks certain companions behind a karma requirement. So in order to have certain followers helping you along the way, you might be required to be an evil person or on the flip side, a good person. And more often than not, these choices are not confined to the main quests. You can find them, these moral dilemmas, in side quests just throughout the world. Players have yet another choice to completely ignore the main quest and go gallivanting around the wasteland, exploring or looting or helping or harming whomever. There is no shortage of ways to keep oneself busy in the wasteland, whether that be by delving into the local caves or vaults, or by seeing what gems that the surface can offer, be that loot or interactions with others. Obviously, this feature is not exclusive to Fallout or Bethesda, but the unique setting of the game, as mentioned before, provides a fun little sandbox to exercise this agency within. The plausibility of the events of the game make that experience just that little bit more immersive. It gives the player the ability to say, what if the nukes really did drop, and this really was my story of survival in the aftermath? What would I do? It makes the agency of the game and the choices that you make hit a little bit more close to home. And sometimes you just stop and ask yourself, what would happen if I did this instead? And that question, coupled with everything else I've mentioned so far, culminates in the replayability of these games. Just on the surface, and ignoring any points I already have made, however, if any of you have ever watched a Nurbit video, then you can catch a glimpse of just how much replayability is baked into the core gameplay experience of Fallout, but most of this can just be attributed to the RPG genre in general, so again, not exactly exclusive to Fallout, but it's still there. But on top of all of these unique and different builds and different roles that you can play in Fallout, the game also offers these branching paths. As I've mentioned before, you can choose to go back and see what would happen if you had done this instead of this. Usually, the game ends with you needing to pick a side. You have to make a decision and thus bring the game to its conclusion. I've always been curious about how the canon is decided. Like, obviously the people who own the IP decide what happens in their game, but at the same time, there are so many things that could potentially be happening in the game. How do you decide? Is it just arbitrary or is it logically speaking or is it based on 
goodness or character values or what is that defining factor? I'm pretty sure it's arbitrary considering it's Bethesda, so. But each game ends with a series of cutscenes that details what kinds of choices you made and what kind of effect that had in the end for that main quest line. And if you were involved in many side quests and many different communities and people that you met along the way, the game will also detail what kinds of things happen to them in the wake of the climax of the game. Depending on the choices you made and the state you left things in along the way, these branch paths and alternative endings make you wonder what if I had done this instead, and it gives you the incentive to go back and play the game, whether that's the next week or the next month or the next year or the next five years. This is something I myself have done multiple times, Fallout 3, New Vegas, I have played these games many Many, many times over because they're just so much fun. It gives you the opportunity to experience what the consequences of certain choices might be and to play it out and to just deal with those consequences. You can try to accomplish the most perfect happy ending for as many people as possible or you can go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and turn the wasteland into 1940s Germany. But what we are all left with in the end as an audience is that fighting continued and many lived and died in the wasteland just as they had in the old world because war war never changes wait is this what makes the game replayable or is it just the mod As I said at the beginning, nuclear warfare can be a horrifying thought that enters into people's minds. But maybe this is exactly what makes Fallout so alluring to begin with. Maybe it taps into our morbid curiosity and allows us to catch a glimpse in a world of what ifs. What if China and America officially declared war on each other? What if that war resulted in the launching of nuclear arsenals? What if those nukes really did destroy almost everything on the planet? What if Caesar was right? Did you know her presidency lasted 52 years? years, and that her father, Aradesh, was the Republic's first president? Does that sound like a democracy to you? Or a hereditary dictatorship? As I've said before, the Fallout TV show gave me a lot of hope for the future of Fallout, for the storytelling, and I'm excited to see what comes next. Let me know in the comments what you think makes Fallout so iconic. And if you made it this far, be sure to subscribe, I'd love to see you stick around, and as always, take care y'all.